the Johns Hopkins Science Review, presented by the Johns Hopkins University and WAAM in Baltimore. This is the Johns Hopkins University, famed for 75 years for its contributions to science and the humanities. Here in its many laboratories, Hopkins scientists are constantly probing into the still unknown secrets of science, which, when discovered, will be translated into benefits to be enjoyed by you, the people of America. Each week, we look over the shoulders of these scholars as they work and catch a glimpse of the results of their scientific research. This week, we will see the world from 78 miles up. To introduce tonight's program, here is Lynn Poole of the Johns Hopkins University. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another Johns Hopkins Science Review. Have you ever thought about one of the remarkable things about human beings is that we're never satisfied with anything? Now, I'm perfectly sure that this dissatisfaction, the fact that we're not satisfied with anything, is responsible for the great progress that we have made over the past centuries. Dissatisfaction with certain things makes for progress. Now, take, for example, the airplane. Uh, man was never satisfied to be firmly rooted to the ground. He wanted to fly into the air, to fly in some sort of a machine that would carry him from one place to another. Let me show you these pictures, for example. The science of aeronautics is a fascinating study, and men from earliest times wanting to fly could never achieve this until, in 1903, the Wright brothers built this crude contraption known as the flying machine. This first machine lifted a man but a few feet off the ground. But before very long, the Wright brothers <coughs> had built another machine, this one. This machine flew one of the Wright brothers quite a few feet off the ground for about 35 seconds over the sands <coughs> of Kitty Hawk in North Carolina. Well, from this time, the swift development of the science of aeronautics uh, went on, and we all know that story. One plane took the place of another, and another, and another, until before very long, Giant airliners, such as this Martin 404, were flying from Los Angeles to New York, from Paris to Cairo, flying all around the world, all the time. But yet, we human beings are not satisfied. We want to go faster, and we want to go higher, all the time. To satisfy this uh, desire, scientists have built rockets, such as the one you see here. Rockets that can hurtle through the air at speeds of more than thousands of miles an hour. Now, it's one of these rockets that we want to talk about tonight. It's the rocket known as the Araby. Now, the Araby was developed by the Aerojet Engineering Company, the Douglas Aircraft Company, under the technical supervision of the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory in cooperation with the United States Navy Bureau of Ordnance. This rocket continually flies through the air and brings back information that is important to scientists. As a matter of fact, it's very important to us. Because when we're uh, flying through the air at a later date, we have to know about the cosmic rays in the air. We have to know about the pressures. What effect does this pressure have on the machine that is flying through the air? How will man be able to fly through that air? Many questions have to be answered, and the Araby, this rocket, is helping find those questions. This Araby goes into the air, brings back much information, and is used for quite a number of purposes. We want to discuss one of those purposes tonight. But before we do, let's take a look at the Araby, find out how it flies and how it operates. And to show us this Araby, we have as our guest tonight, Mr. Clyde Holliday, senior engineer at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, who will give us a quick demonstration and a look at the Araby. Thank you, Mr. Poole. <coughs> the Araby, as seen in this diagram, is a long, slender rocket. It carries enough fuel to take it to 70 or 80 miles straight up. It's about 20 feet long. It weighs just over 1,000 pounds and reaches a maximum velocity of around 3,000 miles per hour. The nose 
is sharply pointed and carries the many scientific instruments used in the experiment. This section carries the fuel, and here we have the rocket motor itself. This motor is made up of a complex system of tanks and valves and pipes and many other apparatus that contribute to its propulsion. <clears throat> On the rear, attached to the blunt end, we have a booster rocket that is necessary to give the initial thrust to get the Araby off the ground. Now remember this because you will soon see a typical Araby takeoff. And after, just after the launching, this booster rocket will fall to the ground. After it has fallen, the rocket motor will take over and carry the Aeroby higher and higher into the sky. Now we have another photograph of an Aeroby rocket <coughs> taking off from a launching tower at the White Sands Proving Ground in New Mexico. This rocket <coughs> is launched from a fixed platform or tower so as to direct the rocket in the proper direction and have it to fall in the proper impact area. The scientists sent this rocket aloft and got much information. But still, just like all human beings, the scientists were not satisfied. And we can be glad they weren't because their dissatisfaction leads to the answers to new problems, the new problems in our universe of science. But this uh, one day, a man posed a question. He asked, I wonder if we could put a camera in this rocket, send the camera aloft, and have the camera take photographs of the Earth as the camera climbs into the upper atmosphere. Well now, often in life, the man that asks the question is the man that has to solve the problem. And that's exactly what happened in this case, because Mr. Clyde Holliday asked the question. And let's see how he solved the problem. This is one of the still cameras designed for upper atmosphere photography. <clears throat> this camera has been used in two different rockets. And in spite of this very difficult and hard treatment, it has survived in remarkably good condition. Here is the lens and the shutter. The lens is in perfect condition. The shutter could be used again. <clears throat> This camera makes four by five inch pictures at the rate of about one every two seconds. After the film has been exposed, it is driven into this armored steel magazine that protects the film at impact. Here we have a magazine similar to the one in the camera. And you can see that through this light tight slit in the side of the magazine, the film <coughs> enters and is wound onto this take-up spool inside. <clears throat> After the film has entered the magazine, of course, <clears throat> it is then well protected on impact. <clears throat> this camera was placed in an Araby rocket and was fired at the White Sands Proving Ground in New Mexico. <clears throat> With this thought in mind, suppose we have a look at a typical Arab film. Before the Arab takes off on its flight into the upper atmosphere, let's look again at this rocket, weighing about a thousand pounds and measuring 20 feet from nose to tail. The pointed nose section of the Arab is filled with scientific recording instruments and camera, which will rise 78 miles above the Earth. The body of the rocket is filled with tanks, pipes, and other apparatus, which will force the rocket to catapult through space. Now here is the Araby at White Sands on the desert, being taken to its launching site, where it is carefully and slowly lifted into a standing position so that the steel launching tower can encircle the Araby, ready to set the rocket on a straight up course. In the firm grasp of the launching tower, technicians swarm around the Araby, filling its body with final amounts of fuel, giving last minute adjustments to the delicate instruments. Other technicians carefully check coverings. Every man knows his job is prepared for the final touches before the takeoff. Now the final minute approaches. Wind balloons sent aloft for final wind calculations. 
On the launching tower, a few things remain to be done. The Araby, encased in the tower, stands poised for flight. Excitement grows. Everything on the ground is now ready. And in the blockhouse, protected from possible explosion, scientists are tensely awaiting the final signal. Here's the first warning. Flares streak into the sky. Here's the second warning. And she's off. Streaking into the air at tremendous speed, vapor and smoke trailing behind, beginning to twist and turn. The Araby rushes upward, higher and higher into the upper atmosphere. These photographs show certain points of interest with remarkable detail. They were made with the camera that I showed to you just a moment ago. This is a photograph of the White Sands, where the White Sands Proving Ground gets its name. This is the area of the famous White Sands Monument National Park. Here is the little town of Alamogordo, New Mexico. And this is the Southern Pacific Railroad running from El Paso, Texas, on through Alamogordo and toward the west coast. And here we can see the Holloman Air Force Base and its various runways. <coughs> the second photograph <coughs> was made a few miles north of the one that I've just shown to you. <coughs> this is the approximate location of the original atomic bomb site. <coughs> here we have the ancient lava beds, and here are the cloud formations with the small black shadows cast on the ground by the clouds from above. <coughs> this is the horizon some 800 miles from the camera. And this photograph was made just northwest of Las Cruces, New Mexico, along the Rio Grande River. <coughs> Here we have the Elephant Butte Reservoir, and on down the river, the Cavallo Reservoir. These reservoirs supply water for irrigation purposes to these little farms along the river just below. And now we have Another photograph made <coughs> by the cameras on a trip by the Aerobe. <coughs> we were able to find enough photographs to make a mosaic to <coughs> that forms a 1,400-mile spread from the horizon to the north in upper Wyoming to the south in central Mexico. The total area of this photograph covers over 300,000 square miles. Here again, we can see the White Sands. In this area is the White Sands Proving Ground headquarters from which the rockets are launched. The rockets are launched from here, they travel upward in space, and fall in this area here. Over to the right, we have the ancient lava beds, and in here is <clears throat> the Sandia Mountain Range in Albuquerque, New Mexico. This mosaic, to the best of our knowledge, is the largest land area ever photographed with such detail in so short a time. I'm sure it's tremendously exciting for us to see these photographs and realize that they were taken from a rocket that was 70 miles above the Earth, and to see these photographs with such great clarity and such detail. But we also realize that such a project, the building of such a rocket, and sending it that far above the Earth, is a tremendously costly thing. Also, that scientists have worked laboriously for hours, weeks, and really for months to get a rocket ready to prepare a camera to go at that height. And probably a question comes into our minds. Why is it that scientists want to send these rockets that high in the air? What value is there in such a project? Well, let's turn that question over to Mr. Holliday and ask him to answer it for us. There are many reasons for justifying the making of this photograph. One of the most important, and perhaps one of the most interesting, is the fact that we need some means through which we can determine the orientation or the exact position of the camera in space. 
for instance to reduce the cosmic ray data we must have some idea of just where the rocket is pointing the geiger muller tubes are placed in the rocket in such a manner that we can tell the intensity and the direction from which they came however unless we know the exact position in space of this rocket we would not be able to reduce the data <clears throat> another interesting reason is to obtain as much meteorological data as possible such as the way these clouds for cloud formations look from tremendous altitude <clears throat> and the third reason that we can mention here <clears throat> is the possible use that we might make of such a device <clears throat> for long-range reconnaissance over inaccessible areas such as jungle areas or polar region or in the time of war over enemy territory. The success achieved from sending a rocket up into the air and taking photographs and the very obvious importance of these photographs to all of us led the scientists to ask themselves another question. And this question was, do you suppose we could put a motion picture camera in a rocket, send that up into the upper atmosphere and get motion pictures of the Earth as they fall away as the Earth falls away from the rocket? so we could record this in action as the rocket goes up. Well, now, of course, as you suspected by this time, the man that again asked the question was Mr. Holliday. So the question was turned over to him to find out whether a motion picture camera could be placed in the rocket and sent up to the altitudes of 78 miles above the Earth. How did he solve this question? He can tell us and show us the camera. Here is one of the first cameras that we made. This is a very modest little camera. It used 35 millimeter film and only 50 feet. It operated at a rate of about three frames per second. As in the other camera that I have shown you, the film was driven into this film magazine to protect the film from the forces of the impact. This particular camera was used on two rockets. One rocket established the record for V2 flight in this country. In spite of the fact that it has been used for two different rockets, certain parts of the camera are still in operating condition. For instance, the shutter here <coughs> could still be used again. <coughs> now I would like to show you a more modern version of a high altitude camera. <coughs> this is called a dual 35 millimeter camera. It has a lens on either end. It has two complete camera mechanisms inside. It is placed in a rocket so that when the rocket is pointing straight up, the camera looks out horizontally from each side. <coughs> now I would like to show you the inside of this mechanism. <coughs> the camera film is protected by the same start a film magazine that we have used in all of the other cameras. This type of magazine has been so successful that we have not to date lost any film because of magazine failure. The camera is driven by a common motor so that both films can be operated in a synchronous manner. The supply spool is just back of the take-up spool. And the film comes from the supply spool across here and down through the intermittent motion mechanism. And then after exposure, it is driven into the cassette and is wound up on this reel. Now I will show you how the camera actually looks in operation. By the way, I would like to show you a lens that we have used on one of these cameras. As amazing as it may seem, these lenses, as delicate as they are, often, more often than not, survive the terrific impact on the desert floor. This lens 
as a matter of fact, made the motion pictures that we are about to show you now. This film of the preparation and launching of a captured German V-2 rocket is being shown through the courtesy of the Jerry Fairbanks Studios. The film of the Earth was taken by the Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. Here the giant V-2 rocket rolls across the desert. In a tremendous tower, the rocket is raised into firing position for final instrumentation and last minute adjustments. Technicians perform their work with skill and precision. Now the camera is ready to be slid into place in the rocket at this point to film the Earth during the upward journey. And here is Mr. Holliday sliding his fantastic camera into a slit in this tremendous rocket, placing it carefully so that it will not be shaken or broken during its upward journey, so that it will not be crushed when it strikes the Earth on its return trip from 78 miles up. Technical operations completed, weather balloons are sent up to check again the wind direction to make calculations and corrections. Outside the blockhouse, lines are ready. Launching activities complete. Inside the blockhouse, hundreds of dials, coils, and scientific equipment must be set, checked, and prepared for the firing of the rocket. Must be ready to record the information which will be sent back to Earth by delicate instruments within the rocket. There's the warning flare. Rocket ready. 20. 19, 18, 17, 16, 15. Fire! With a tremendous roar, the rocket ignites. Flames burst from its tail. Lumbering like a prehistoric monster, the rocket climbs up through its launching tower and begins its journey up into outer space. Now the rocket is hurtling through the air at incredible speed. It leaves a smoke and vapor trail behind it. Our cameras on the ground move to catch the ascent, while electronic equipment follows the course of the rocket as it begins to zigzag its way aloft. Now the cameras in the rocket are grinding, filming the Earth as the rocket moves further up into the atmosphere. At this moment, you are looking straight down at the world, looking down from a rocket at a height greater than any man has ever flown. Watch the Earth as it falls away from the rocket. Tall mountain ranges are in the background. Peaks thousands of feet high are flattening out. The rocket rolls toward these high mountain ranges, which now appear to be mere anthills from this great height. And gaining speed, the rocket rolls more. Look closely as the Earth spins by, and you will see the curvature of the Earth. The curve of distant horizon, a dramatic proof that Columbus was right. Flat mesas, more mountain ranges, rivers, lakes, towns, and long lines of railroad tracks are all rolling by as the rocket continues to twist its way aloft. This is even more than a bird's eye view of the world. It is higher than any bird could fly. We are being catapulted through the air at speeds of more than 3,000 miles per hour. Yes, we are 78 miles above the Earth and looking down at the ancient lava bed 700 miles away from the rocket. Lava beds left by live volcanoes more than two centuries ago. Here we have a view of the famous Gulf of California stretching its long distance way below, 78 miles below us. We have reached the maximum height. Now we begin our fall toward Earth, rocket and camera plummeting toward the ground like a giant boulder. And on the way down, here again is the Gulf of California. This is a flight into the upper atmosphere. 
a flight on which we have been able to view the Earth from 78 miles straight up. We're glad that we've had the opportunity of showing you these films. And I'm sure that the men who developed the art and the science of still photography and those men who developed the art of motion picture photography would be proud and happy if they knew today what use was being made of their discoveries and their development. They would be happy to know that their cameras, developed to the state that they are, can take photographs from 70 miles up in the air. We're also happy that we've had the chance to show you these films, the only films in existence of the world from 70 and 78 miles in the air, because this week we are being joined by a number of new stations on our network. Stations in Boston, out on the West Coast, down in the South as far as New Orleans. We want to welcome the viewers in those cities and tell you that each week we will try to bring you a worthwhile and an entertaining program. And next week, we hope that all of you will be with us when we have the privilege of presenting the story of a parchment. We hope you will join us next week for a story about a piece of parchment a parchment which is part of our national heritage of democratic freedom. This precious document is housed in the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., where it is ex exhibited in a shrine for all to see. 150 years old in June, this parchment has disintegrated, and it was feared that the forceful words would fade from the surface of the document. It has now been preserved for all posterity by scientists of the National Bureau of Standards. We are honored that we are fortunate enough to be the first to demonstrate for you the full and complete scientific processes by which this parchment has been saved for future generations. Be with us next week for the story of a parchment. <laughs> The Johns Hopkins Science Review is produced by Lynn Poole. Associate producer, Robert Fenwick. The director is Ed Serro. Associate director, Ken Kelpie. Art direction by Barry Mansfield. Your narrator has been Joel Chaseman. Portions of this program have been mechanically reproduced. The Johns Hopkins Science Review originated in the studios of WAAM in Baltimore. This is the Dumont Television Network.